And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge that this is our final uh, VFTT for the year, and it's the Ronak Desai Memorial Talk. Uh, Ronak was a member of the MBA class of 2010, and we're joined today by several of his classmates and friends uh, as our special guests. Um, Ronak was a remarkable and accomplished individual, and as a student leader of the View from the Top series, he was passionate about exploring how prominent leaders who run some of the world's most influential enterprises can truly impact the lives of millions. He recognized that each of these leaders have their own personal story, their own values, and their own ideas about how to make change happen. His desire to learn from these individuals was motivated by a commitment uh, to, uh, to reflecting on his own personal leadership story. He aimed to leave a positive and significant mark on the world, but he wanted to do so in a way that was consistent with his values. To this end, his talent and ambition was always complemented by his extraordinary warm spirit and his uh, gracious good humor. After Ronak's untimely death, his classmates asked if we could dedicate one talk each year in his memory. This year, we thought it was only appropriate uh, to invite Ken Chanel to give this special talk as Ronak interviewed Ken when he was last here in 2010. In the spirit of today's talk, I encourage you to reflect not only on our speaker and the company that he runs, but what his experience and the ex experience of all of the speakers uh, in our series can teach you about your own role and potential as a leader. I hope and I think Ronak would also hope that this reflection helps you set your sights a little farther, challenge yourself a little bit harder, and to, challenge, and to think more, a bit more deeply about what it means to pursue a life of meaning and impact while staying true to yourself and the things that you value. As a tribute to Ronak, before we begin, please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. So now I'd like to welcome and introduce Ken Chenault, the Chairman and CEO of American Express. Ken has been in American Express for more than 30 years, having joined the company in its strategic planning group in 1981. Before this, he worked as an associate at Roger and Wells after graduating from Harvard Law School and worked as a consultant at Bain & Company. He was promoted to president and COO at American Express in 1997 and was named CEO in 2001. American Express, or Amex, founded in 1850 is a Fortune 100 diversified financial services company with more than 30 billion in revenue. It's one of the 30 companies that make up the Dow Jones Industrial Average and is best known for its credit card, charge card, and traveler's check business. In, indeed, Amex accounts for roughly 24% of the total dollar volume of credit card transactions in the United States. Much of their success stems not from an individual product, however, but for their long-standing prowess in consumer marketing that I'm sure you're well aware of. Membership has its privileges. Don't leave home without it. These are just a couple of taglines that have really entered the American cultural lexicon. And as a result, American Express is truly one of the best known brands in the world today and is consistently ranked among the world's top 25 most valuable brands. Another reason the brand is so valuable is Amex's commitment uh, and reputation for customer service. In 2012, J.D. Power ranked Amex highest for customer satisfaction among card issuers for the sixth straight year. Fortune recently listed as one of the 15 most admired companies in the world. Ken Chenault and his team have certainly uh, played a critical role in building and maintaining this strong brand. When Ken was here in 2010, he talked about leading his 65,000 employees through the many challenges the company's experienced during his time as CEO, saying, clearly my tenure has been one of confronting some of the most challenging crises that we've seen in the last 10 years. I take my motto from Napoleon, make sure people are grounded in reality and give them strategies to be hopeful. Ken's made an impact well beyond Amex. He's currently co-chair of the Business Roundtable. He serves on the board of IBM, is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, and has received many business and civic awards. Ebony Magazine named him one of 50 living pioneers in the African-American African community, having been only the third African-American to run a Fortune 500 company. Today, Andrew Baldwin, one of our second year student leaders from the View from the Top team, is going to interview Ken. And so please join me today in, welp in welcoming Ken Chenault to Stanford GSB. Thanks. So what seat do you want me in? I'll take the further one. 
Okay. All right. <clears throat> so thank you very much for coming today. Um, when I found out that I was going to get the chance to interview you, I was thrilled. And it took me back to the first time that I interacted with American Express, the brand. I had just graduated from college, and I was moving from Indiana to New York. And when I got to New York, I found out that New York's a little more expensive than I thought. So as any responsible 22-year-old, I applied for my first credit card. It was a visa. And they gave me that a credit card. That was the first mistake. That was the first mistake. <laughs> the only mistake I've made since. Um, and they gave me a credit limit of $1,500. And I told a friend this story. He said, you're an idiot for not getting an American Express. So the next day, I applied for American Express. And American Express gave me a credit limit of $25,000. <laughs> when I look back, I can only think that you personally thought that I was 16 times more valuable than Visa did. <laughs> so hopefully I can repay some of that appreciation through this talk. <laughs> Thank you. I want to start out the interview with a very similar question to what Ronick asked during his 2010 interview. You've led Amex through a pretty incredible time. Right after you joined as CEO, or right after you became CEO, 9-11 occurred. And then you also were the head of a financial services company during the worst financial downturn in 80 years and kept your job, which is no small feat. Can you walk us through the one or two days that were the biggest tests or the largest challenges? Certainly. First, uh, just let me say it's, it's a real honor to uh, be here. And obviously, uh, I remember Ronak very vividly and was just impressed with both his authenticity and his humility. Uh, so it means a lot for me to be here. We really appreciate it. So let me just say that um, obviously 9-11 uh, and the financial crisis were absolutely incredible. I would say the most horrible, obviously, was 9-11 from an from a emotional standpoint because we lost uh, 11 employees. And uh, the loss of human life uh, is, is always a tragedy. What was most important there was to rally the organization to understand both the reasons uh, why they should be hopeful uh, but also dealing with the reality that the travel industry uh, was in total disarray. Uh, spending on our credit cards had dropped dramatically. And what I recognized was that we had to transform the company uh, in a relatively short period of time. And uh, that leads me to one of, I think, the real challenges from a leadership standpoint is how to be decisive and compassionate. So within 60 days of 9-11, I decided that we had to substantially change our cost structure, which meant that we were going to have to lay off employees. And uh, many uh, people in my top executive team uh, said this is not the time to do it and from an emotional standpoint they were absolutely right. The concern that I had was that the future of the company was at stake and I said we have to do this in a compassionate way with our employees but we have to do it. And what I believe very strongly that one of the things you've got to do in leadership is you need to tell people both the truth and you don't talk down to people. And you explain to people the reasons why. And I'll cut to the chase just to simplify so we can also talk about the financial crisis, is what I explained to people were the reasons why what was happening to the company. And at that time, uh, we always do a employee survey. And a third of our incentive compensation is really based on the satisfaction and engagement of our employees, because we really do believe in the surface, surface profit chain. And people said, Ken, if you're going to lay off uh, basically 12% of the workforce, the last thing you want to do is to do a survey on it. And I said, not only are we going to survey the employees, but we're going to survey the people that we laid off. Um, because from a leadership standpoint, everyone has to be held accountable. And I think partially because of the times that we were in with 9-11, but also the leadership and the way that was done, we received the highest employee survey scores that we had in years. 
So that was very much a turning point for the company. And then frankly, one of the most exciting things for me was over the last five to 10 years is in fact to see some of those employees come back to the company because of the growth of the company and what was happening. The financial crisis was very different. On one level, uh, it didn't have the, you know, the emotion of the loss of human life, but you really felt that you were falling off the cliff. And in a crisis, what I think is very, very important, and where it really hit me uh, was when Congress uh, voted against TARP. Uh, and uh, I vividly remember my son, who's now a junior in college, calling me and saying, Dad, everyone says that the company's going down and you're going to be fired. And I said, Kevin, it's not going to be that bad. Um, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, but the reality is uh, that represented the fear because to me, when messages permeate the playground, you know this is really serious, uh, that there are real problems. And for us, where we were impacted is we were very reliant on the wholesale funding model. So we did not take deposits. And so literally over a weekend, and this goes to the power of a brand, I said, we've got to get into the deposit business. And both inside and outside the company, people said, you know, given what's going on with financial services companies and the environment, there is no way you're going to get this up and running. The only way we could do it was, in fact, to work with third parties. So we, in fact, worked with other financial services companies to, to basically sell our deposit products. And um, I then put together a mantra for the company because uh, I wanted to have all 60,000 plus employees focused on what we needed to do. And it was really simple. Stay liquid, stay profitable, and then the hope part was selectively invest in growth. So even in the most challenging times, I wanted to reinforce that we were not going to take our eye off the ball of really being focused on growth. But staying liquid was critical. And fortunately, within around 30 days, we'd raised around $8 billion in deposits. We now have over $40 billion in deposits. That gave me a lot of hope and gave the organization and the company a lot of hope because I said, why would people be putting money in with us if they thought we were going out of business, number one? Number two, we, we were able to stay profitable. That was critical. Third was what I also looked at as far as cons customer health was how many customers traded down from our more expensive products to less uh, price products, and the reality is almost zero. And we had hardly anyone who left the franchise. That gave me a lot of confidence. Then the third thing that we were able to do, back to the mantra, is we were very clear to people in the company where we were investing. And that allowed us uh, to come out of the crisis frankly, really roaring. So the momentum of the company was very, very strong. And my experience, frankly, over 30 years is what you see with companies is it really is what happens uh, during a crisis is how do companies act, how balanced they are. The majority of companies, in fact, hunker in the bunker, uh, don't really have a broader perspective, don't focus on growth. And then generally, two to three years after a crisis, you start to see this demarcation uh, that's caused. And that's exactly what happened for us. Fortunately, we were on the positive side of that. And speaking of a lighter note, over those 30 years, and even maybe more specifically over the last 12 as CEO, is there one day that you look to and you're like, man, that is the day why I, th that's the reason why I do this. This is a great day. This is kind of what gets me excited and, and and just um, passionate about the business. Is there one day you'll look back to? I, I would say literally there, uh, fortunately, are hundreds of days. Because my view in business is if, if you're not having fun, it's not worth it. But I'll give you one example that, again, uh, was a tragedy, but uh, gave me a lot of pride is um, I think everyone certainly remembers the tsunami. 
and you've got the problem, Andy, not me. Um, My second mistake. That's right. Yeah. And, 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 and the reality was that uh, our employees around the world with literally no instructions from top management did incredible things to serve people. Uh, and that just gave me incredible pride because when people feel empowered to make a difference and literally um, make up policies on their own, but it was because they really believed in the service mission and the service ethic of the company, uh, that's where I felt great. But fortunately, I have literally hundreds of examples like that uh, that make me feel great about being at the company. You're making my transitions really easy to the next question. So the next question is actually about customer service. Right. When I think about American Express, I think it's the gold standard of service. And in fact, you've taken a really boring piece of plastic and turned it into a club that has a cult following. This room is full of aspiring entrepreneurs or managers who want to build equally great brands, equally great service cultures. How did American Express do it? And what would you, what knowledge or advice would you provide to them? Yeah, here's what I think is very, very important in building a brand is uh, if you think about what are the attributes of the most powerful brands, uh, brands are really about bringing a rational and emotional connection because the best brands have a personal engagement. And the best brands and the brands that are really long-term are those brands that in fact have what I call a higher purpose. That it's more than just selling a product, uh, that you're changing people's lives, you're impacting people's lives, uh, you're allowing people to have fun. And when you have a brand that combines that rational value proposition with a emotional connection, it's really powerful. What people forget, because the card has been so successful, is the company started off as a freight forwarding company. And what's critical is the reinvention of the company over 163 years. One was that commitment to service was really critical. The point I make about our traveler's check business uh, is that it had no income requirement. Uh, anyone could get it. It was used all over the world. That helped build the brand allowing us to offer a card. Right now, part of what I do, particularly with the partnerships that we have with a number of digital companies, I say the form factor is irrelevant. The reality is think about the card as a platform to deliver service. Uh, so what's important is that you've got to understand to create a brand, you need a core mission, and for us, uh, we want to be the most respected service brand. Uh, trust of the brand is very critical. Service is very critical. Security is very critical. Um, and then what you've got to do is constantly innovate. Uh, because if you want to be a leading brand, you've got to innovate in the marketplace all the time. Uh, and what I would also emphasize with respect to service is what I found is, and I say this publicly, and um, certainly I'm very competitive, I wanna win, uh, so I don't foolishly give out secrets, but the reality is that most companies don't wanna make a commitment to service. One is because it's a long-term investment, two is they don't have the right metrics in place to know they're getting the returns. We, in fact, know what service interactions will generate levels of spending. Uh, we know what will drive retention and loyalty of our customers. And one of the things that we did in our service, despite the fact that uh, for years we had great service, around 10 years ago, we said, we're going to revamp it. We're gonna reinvent the way we do service. We think people are too robotic. We think it, we're too rule focused. And we wanna empower the people who are serving our customers, whether that's online or offline. Uh, and we literally changed fundamental aspects uh, of our service. 
And that leads to a very important point, which I believe in strongly is, you always want to create the company that will put yourself out of business. Uh, that's the way you constantly need to think. And if you believe that you're successful and you get arrogant about that success, that success becomes a rut. Spe specifically on one service point, I love your customers customer service representatives, so much so that I probably confide in them more than my own parents sometimes. Right. <laughs> and they're consistently and always friendly. What, what's the secret training or recruitment process that you use to always have that consistency? Because I actually view that as a pretty big competitive advantage. It's a big advantage. You know, here's, here's the simple answer to that. And um, it took us a while to get there. His attitude makes a difference is actually hire people who like to serve people. That is a stunning insight. Uh, I mean, give me a break. Uh, um, and so you, in fact, can interview people. You can test people. You can assess people who really do have the attributes and have the desire uh, to serve and really enjoy it. There are some people, in fact, uh, when I talk to even senior people and I interview them and I talk about service as a higher purpose, I get some people say, hey, that's not a purpose for me. Uh, it's not a higher purpose for me. That's fine. Then I don't want to hire you. Uh, because at the end of the day, you've really got to believe in what the core mission is. But attitude really does make a difference. And you can interview. You can assess for it. Uh, you can empower people, uh, but uh, sometimes companies get so bogged down in policies and rules that for us, uh, as terrific as we were historically as a service company, we did not explicitly enough focus on the attitude of people that we were hiring. And now, over the last 20 years, our retention rates our customer SAT scores are off the graph and our service levels are really strong because we have people who really enjoy serving people. And not everyone does. A, a couple weeks ago, Jack Dorsey was on the stage here and he was talking about kind of the shift in, in almost commerce and payments and Absolutely. that everything from how we buy, where we buy, what we use to buy is going to change. And he talked about Square's e-wallet how does a company that's been around for 163 years kind of fit in with this model? And are we, are we going to stop carrying credit cards? Uh, we could. And frankly, I don't care. Uh, because it's really what's behind the card. So Jack uh, actually talked to, before he started Square, uh, we work with Square. Uh, they acquire a lot of merchants for us. What I think is absolutely terrific is that Jack is empowering uh, small merchants uh, and really helping small business. We are the largest provider to small business. Uh, so the synergy is really strong. What I think is important and the way you change is, I believe commerce is changing dramatically. And uh, the way I talk about our company now is that part of our objective is bringing buyers and sellers together. And uh, the advantage that we have, and this is an advantage that Jack recognizes, and I give him a lot of credit for, is Square is built off an existing payments infrastructure. That's a real advantage. So he has been innovative. What he hasn't done is to say, I got to change everything. That's one of the reasons why I like the mobile app Uber because they're building off an existing platform and they're innovating and changing the payments experience. So for us, what we've said is we have a major, major advantage in that we are the most integrated payments platform of anyone. So we acquire merchants, we process merchant transactions, we are an issuer, and we authorize transactions all over the world. There is no other card company, no one in payments, who has a fully integrated payments model. We're the only one. Now, what that does is we talk about a closed loop, and that means we have information on the end user customer and the merchant. 
And the ability to do modeling and algorithms with that data is going to give us, frankly, an even bigger advantage going forward than in the past because the convergence of online offline unleashes the assets and capabilities that we have in the platform. So part of what we started to do almost a decade ago was to say we really are going to embrace the digital transformation. And what we've done is with existing people in the company, uh, people have really been able to change. Those who weren't uh, are no longer with the company uh, because the reality is that they had to keep up with the change. What I've also done is bring in people from outside the company and have a mix and match. So we promote probably 60 to 65% of our people from within, but we also bring in people from the outside. And I'll give you one way that I dramatize this to our board, is I had a voiceover uh, of someone talking about what the brand meant to them. And they talked about Amex and trust, security, service, reinvention. And then as you pan down, you saw the nose earring and the earrings and the tattoos. And I said, welcome to the new American Express. Because the point is, this reinvention is critical. Uh, so I think that uh, the assets are there, the partnerships, um, I'll just mention one that I'm excited about uh, with Twitter where we're using our uh, closed loop platform uh, where you can do tweet to buy. We're the only ones that can do that with Twitter. So when it was announced, all these folks were calling up Twitter and saying, we, we'd like to do the same thing. And Twitter responded, the problem is Amex is the only one that has the platform. Uh, so clearly, There'll be people, and there's a lot going on. There's more innovation going on right now in commerce and payments than almost any place else. But we're not standing still. Staying with the theme of innovation, I want to pivot to policy. Right. You're on the President's Council for Jobs and um, in Competitiveness. I was. It's no longer you, in you existence, were. but I was. And yes. if Probably. we were to treat <laughs> the president or the United States as one of your customers who's over-levered, um, hypothetically. What advice would you give on kind of current deficit levels, how to manage um, you know, increasing debt levels over time? So uh, obviously, with the proper service training, I do it in a very uh, polite but forceful way. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, I think what is uh, most important, and, and from my experience on the Jobs Council, I went in uh, questioning how much of a difference could be made in creating jobs. I actually um, believe that the jobs issue is a solvable issue. Uh, we did a lot of work identifying different industry areas where we can drive growth, putting together both short and long-term strategies. Obviously, you get down to politics and getting that through on both sides of the house. Uh, but the reality is that uh, I think there's several things that need to be done. Uh, one is uh, we do have to promulgate some pro-growth policies. Uh, when I look at the infrastructure in the US. Uh, there are major improvements that have to be made that can help stimulate job growth, but also can make us a more productive and competitive economy. Secondly, we have to deal with entitlements. Uh, that's just the reality. And so back to your analogy of someone who is having credit problems, you got to sit down and you got to say, here's the spending that has to stop. Uh, but thirdly, I think what's very important is that tax reform in a comprehensive way, both personal and corporate, uh, we've got to really bring about a set of fundamental changes. And I think that what is required is not just an issue of 
being focused on what the President, the Senate, and the House does, I think we need to put more public pressure on. And I look at this, frankly, as almost like a social movement that um, your generation, the next generation, your lives are in jeopardy. If you really felt that on a social issue, I think you would have a much different attitude and approach. And I think we need a far more engaged electorate uh, that is gonna put real pressure uh, because the existing approach is not driving change fast enough. That, that's great feedback. And from what I understand about American Express's culture, you have a culture of constructive confrontation and transparency. And here at the GSB, we have a euphemism that feedback's a gift. Um, could you share with us a story when you had to give or receive one of these gifts that's not so pleasant? Sure, sure. <laughs> um, I, I would say probably halfway, three quarters uh, through my career, uh, things were going really well. Um, I thought I was uh, uh, getting terrific feedback, which in general I was. Um, and we had this process where uh, you got feedback and there were always 10 things that you did really well and then 10 things that you needed to improve. And it didn't matter who you were, you always had 10 things that you needed to improve because um, if you was, no matter what your station, you should always focus on being a good leader. So it was always depressing, particularly if you're really focused on saying, I want to be the best to confront that there are things you got to focus on. Then we started to say, well, what are one or two things that you need to focus on? And in our feedback process, you had to talk to your team about, here are the things. Here are the things that are positive. Here are the things that are negative. And um, so one thing that came out with me is uh, that I didn't listen well. And um, I actually thought, geez, I, I am respectful for people, I sit in meetings, I listen to people, and the feedback I got was, Ken, you know, your mind's always racing, and if you don't think someone is saying something that's really smart, you literally will just turn off. Uh, you won't frown, but we know that you are not there. That's not what's going on here, right, uh, between us? Not at all, not at all. <laughs> Um, and uh, that, really, that really hit me. I mean, I didn't fully realize I was doing it and didn't really realize not just the impact it was having on the person that I was talking to, but obviously the impact that had in the entire room. Uh, because at that time, I wasn't president, but I was a pretty senior person. And uh, you know, almost the phrase was, you know, this is one of Ken's zone outs. Uh, and he's thinking about something else. And one of the things that I clearly learned from that feedback was that I was missing out. It doesn't mean that every time someone was talking to me, I thought they were saying something that was really terrific. Uh, I would certainly let them know, I don't think that's a great idea, here are the reasons why, but I was actively engaged. And um, you've gotta have that two-way street and if you listen some more, uh, those ideas can come out. So the, the ability to be what I call an active listener can actually empower that person who you're talking to. That was a real learning for me and was incredibly helpful. And it took several years before I got the recognition that I was an active listener. Now people say, boy, Ken is a really good listener. Um, someone who's been in the company a long time, they say, well, let me tell you about Ken 10 or 15 years ago. He wasn't such a great listener. So that's, but I think for anyone, one of the things that I try to do really every year is think about two or three areas that I want to improve going forward in my own leadership. Um, so I'm going to lean in for this next question. Right. Um, I know that you are very close friends with Sheryl Sandberg and a big fan of her philosophy, Lean In. Mm -hmm. But the facts are, and kind of 
unfortunately so, that inequality mm -hmm. still exists. Sure. You're one of six African-American CEOs. There are only 20 female Fortune 500 CEOs. Um, why is the path so difficult for African-Americans, females, uh, and other minorities at very senior levels within corporate America? Yeah, I, I think there are several reasons. I mean, I think um, clearly uh, what you can't deny is that bias and prejudice still exists, and the legacy of bias and prejudice has a major impact. Uh, that just doesn't go away. Uh, and, uh, you know, I always go back, if I could rewrite history uh, and say in, just pick a, an era, in the 1920s, there was full equal opportunity despite all that happened historically. I think we would be so far ahead, but that didn't happen. Uh, and um, so I think you've got to deal with that issue. I think second is, and this is part of what Cheryl is talking about, we can all analyze um, the reasons why we can't get ahead. And we should be very focused on that, and we should all feel a collective responsibility to change that. But one of the points when I was growing up uh, that my father emphasized with me was focus on what you can, what you can control. And the only thing you can control is your performance. There's several ways you can look at that. He was not saying that to limit me. What he was saying was that opens up a range of opportunities. And from a accountability standpoint, don't, in fact, um, run away from that problem or challenge or barrier. Figure out a way to jump over it. And so what uh, Cheryl is certainly not saying is um, that there are not a set of major issues and big issues and institutional issues that women have to deal with, but that women clearly can take increasing ownership for what they need to do, that a support structure is very helpful because we all need a support structure and that's important, and uh, that we gotta take it very personally. I think at the end of the day, uh, what's most important uh, is there's a surprising phenomenon that happens, and it's not really surprising. When you get people in positions who look different and are different, all of a sudden, several years later, you get more people who look like them. And so the representation issue is a big issue, is an important issue. Um, and it is at some point, uh, and this is where I go to just business metrics, if someone is simply saying each year, Ken, I'm gonna grow, uh, this business is really gonna do well, here are my strategies, and each year nothing happens, that's a problem. So if there is a real commitment and a real focus, then there need to be measures and there needs to be accountability so that those things happen. Uh, and uh, I think that a business mentality around that can bring about some very important social change. Um, I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience. And right before I do, I just want to say one quote that I found particularly mm -hmm. inspiring from you. In the 2008 um, commencement address at Howard University, you said, it's your responsibility to the larger African-American community to face prejudice and to make progress, to face history and to make history. And um, that was something that I really enjoyed in reading and was inspired by, so um, I just wanted to share that feedback in a public setting. But um, thank you. love to open up uh, the audience to Q&A and uh, let the tough questions roll. Good. Someone in the front here. Hi, uh, 
Hi, uh, my name is Nikki jordan Earl, and I'm a second year MBA student here. Good. Really glad that you're able to join us today. Thanks. So I have a two part question related to sort of those very tough decisions that you were talking about, you know, going into the deposits <laughs> business, et cetera. Um, one, when you make those tough decisions, would you say it's more of a intuition, gut feeling that you have or more consensus driven uh, from the people and your, your really senior advisors? And the second part of that is, it is more gut and what you think is the right decision, then what is your process for bringing people on board and really rallying people behind really tough decisions? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think, um, one, what I'm a firm believer in is that you have to apply what I call situational leadership. That uh, you can't just follow one style. Um, uh, sometimes you have to have a directive style. Sometimes you have to have a consensus building style. Uh, there have to be some attributes from a leadership standpoint. One of those that I talk a lot about is integrity because that's the only way you, you're going to build trust and that's, for me, the consistency of words and actions. But um, in some cases, uh, I have relied on my gut but backed up with some analysis. Uh, I think it's very, very rare, sometimes uh, on creative issues, uh, I'll look at a piece of uh, advertising and you sort of know this is it. Uh, and you can't totally explain why. But in a lot of situations, I think you can analyze and you should, uh, but then judgment is really important, but judgment should be based on what's the criteria that you're using to make that judgment? What are the values that you're applying to make that judgment? So what I don't believe in is making blind judgments. I think you always need to have some criteria and you always need to have that balanced by what values uh, are important. From a consensus standpoint, there are some issues that I know where I want to go, uh, but I know that I've got to get everyone involved. And I'll give you one example. When I took over as CEO, I said I want to change actually some of the core attributes of our culture. Uh, I didn't think we were focused explicitly enough on winning in the marketplace. I didn't think we engaged enough in constructive confrontation. So I literally put, here are the values I'd like for the company on a piece of paper for myself. And then I said, in fact, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do um, sessions all around the world. And I want teams sort of to come up with the values. And I'd say very honestly, um, I don't know what I would have done if the values hadn't pretty much matched what I had on the sheet of paper. Uh, but fortunately, they did. The benefit of that was the buy-in was almost instant because people knew it was a consensus-driven process. It wasn't me mandating that. So I think there's certain issues where you mandate. I'll give you an example where from a, um, uh, the standpoint of having to decide was, um, and this goes back to 9-11, I decided that we were going to return to our headquarters. Uh, the majority of the organization would have voted against it for very understandable reasons. Uh, I thought it was important for us to go back, um, explain the reasons why, and it was accepted. Um, so there's some things that you can't do by consensus, and that was more of a gut belief feeling, but it was based on a set of values, beliefs of why we should go back. Um, so I think you want to make sure uh, that you adapt your leadership style to the situation, which means you've got to assess in the lingo that we use at our company, you've got to assess the readiness of your group to accept certain leadership. So there's some situations where you know you've got to be very directive. There are other situations where you're going to be more consensus driven. Hi, my name is Chandra Chavla and I'm a happy Amex customer. Good. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your thoughts. 
My question is regarding the new markets that are coming up now or emerging. So, for example, there are 2.5 billion people who don't have access to banking. Is Amex planning to do something in that area? And if you are, what challenges do you see given the uh, even lack of brand in those countries and the U.S. relations with those countries? So here's, here's what I think is interesting. One is I think um, a number of the emerging developing markets obviously represent tremendous growth opportunities. What we've seen from a brand standpoint, whether it's China, India, a range of markets, that our brand doesn't limit us. Uh, and people find that strange, but I think one of the reasons why our brand is viewed as a more open brand is because of the heritage of the travel business that we really cut across borders. And so people don't look at us as a U.S. only company alone. Uh, it really has not hurt us. So even in a place like Russia, uh, the brand uh, is really powerful. But I think the key part of your question is, um, how do we open the brand? So back to the importance of this convergence of online offline, the implication of that, of what I've said to our people is, scale has been redefined. So it's not enough to say, well, we got 100 million cards when Facebook has a billion customers. Google has 1.7 billion customers. Uh, and the fact that, to your point, there are many people that don't have access to credit and debit products. So we're very focused on it. So I'll talk to you about two things we're doing. One is we've come out with what's called a reloadable prepaid card, which a reloadable prepaid card is you deposit money into the card. The reality is that this was first launched in the US, but we also are going to be launching in a number of markets around the world. And in the U.S. alone, there are 34 billion households that are unbanked or underbanked. So that means if you don't have a checking account, you pay $800 to $1,000 to, in fact, have access to your own money. All right? So if you want to cash your paycheck, you pay to cash your paycheck. You want to send money to someone, someone in LA from here, it could cost you 10 or $11 to send 80 bucks. So the reality is that there is a tremendous need. So we came out with a product that is in fact on a digital platform. Uh, and it is, uh, you can operate it totally on mobile. And as you know, the penetration of smartphones is as high or higher in non-affluent sectors than it is affluent sectors because they can't afford a laptop, they can't afford broadband services. So this is a product that people initially said to me, well, Amex, you know, you've got these high-end cards. How can you offer this product? And I said, back to the future. The reality is the traveler's check business, freight forwarding business, was that a prestigious business? That, in fact, enhanced the brand because we were focused on service. The question is creating the right value proposition with the right economics to that segment. We think this is going to be a very exciting product. Since we launched it in October, 85% of the customers coming in are new to the franchise. Uh, almost 50% are under 35. Um, so we have a lot of hope there. Another thing we're doing in China is we have done a joint venture with a company called Leanne Leanne. You've heard of mobile top-up. So you go and you want to top up your minutes on your phone. In China, you go to a kiosk. What we're doing is off of a mobile phone, uh, you'll have the access to do P2P. We're in three provinces now. We're expanding. This company has 300 million customers. So I wouldn't mind getting a nice percentage and penetration of that customer base. So what's important is that we have redefined the scale. And then we've said there are also opportunities to bring in, to bring buyers and sellers together around the world. Why? Because we have a global authorization system where literally we can 
basically decide every single transaction what that credit limit is going to be instantaneously. Well, if you think about a global marketplace and the ability cross-border for goods and services, that presents a tremendous opportunity. So the traditional card business is changing dramatically. We're not walking away from that business, but we're expanding dramatically into other areas. And if we don't dramatically grow in those markets, we're not going to be a growth company. So we have a strong focus there. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Or someone here, right, right in front, Andy. Or... Is it on? Oh. Is it on? Oh, OK. Um, you can give her one more. One of the uh, benefits of defining yourself in terms of a higher purpose is that it doesn't confine you to a particular product or service or category. Um, how far do you think you can and how far do you want to push the Amex brand? Do you think there will come a time where our relationship with Amex occurs in something that's completely removed from financial transactions or financial services? Yeah, you know, already if you think about it, um, your relationship with us is, um, I think, more than just a financial transaction. Um, we are, and always have been, far more involved as a lifestyle product. So when people ask me about competition, I'm competing with almost every lifestyle provider in the traditional business. Because if I'm reduced to facilitating a payment, that doesn't make me special at all. So I think that where you're going to see us uh, spread out more is in commerce. Uh, so the things we've done with Twitter and Facebook, where you can take what we call our spin graph and connect it to the interests and preferences of a Facebook customer and connect them is pretty powerful. And we can do that with a closed loop. So uh, I think that certainly we're going to spread out more in commerce. Travel gives us a tremendous opportunity of what we're doing from a lifestyle standpoint. Uh, the last thing I want, right, where we will have a problem is if we're positioned more and more as just a financial services company. What has helped us tremendously from a brand standpoint is the customer looks at us more as a service company than a financial services company. I want to make sure I keep that demarcation. So, so we'll do one last question because we skipped you. We'll repeat it if you just say yeah, it. sure. So first of all, my name is Beatrice. I'm actually from GSP Consulting Penn. Um, when Max was in my first, uh, the first conference that I got to know and was at the last session, so I really appreciate it. I also want to say after graduating, I learned a great deal by practicing, so I found this particularly helpful even more than two years ago. Um, but my question is, now you are the CEO president, how do you make sure you don't get blind spots and people are not afraid to give you direct feedback mm -hmm. to make sure you continually are at your best and maintain the culture you work for? Yeah, I, I think what's very, very important is one, uh, which I feel strongly is, um, I think it's a mistake and a number of people do it, is they get their person confused with the job they hold. Uh, I don't get I try not to get that confused. I like being CEO, uh, but that's not where I take my self-worth from the fact that I'm CEO. One of the things that I do in a very, very aggressive way is I seek out feedback and input both inside and outside the company, uh, is really to talk to people who have very different perspectives from mine to try to find out and to build a network uh, both inside and outside the company that will talk to me. Because the reality is, it doesn't matter who you are, people will be well-meaning and they'll say, I don't really want to talk to Ken about this. I just don't want to worry him. Well, the reality is sometimes when that's done, uh, I'm missing a big issue that can impact the company, and that's not helpful. 
it's my job then to make sure that I'm very aggressive from an outreach uh, standpoint. And so I really am throughout the company, through hierarchy. People who know, know me know that if you report directly into me, it's not that I'm going to be checking on you with other people, but I'm going to call people five or ten levels down in the company. Uh, I'm going to have meetings with people. Uh, it's not going to be based on title. It's based on learning about what the issues are, uh, what the problems are. And then outside, what I want to ask people is, what do you think we're doing wrong? What do you think we need to do better? What are the issues? And that goes back to the constructive confrontation. So you really want to create a climate where you're being pushed. And in fact, I don't think I'm really getting the true word unless I go through periods where I'm feeling uncomfortable. Uh, and I think that's a good state for people to be in periodically, not permanently, but periodically uncomfortable, uh, because that is a leveler. And that's important, particularly when you're a CEO, to be in those situations uh, where you can be in a more level place. In closing, we always ask our view from the top speakers the same question that we all have to answer on the GSB application. What matters to you most and why? Well, things change over time. Uh, what I would say is what matters to me most uh, is really my wife and my two sons. Uh, from a public policy standpoint, what matters to me most is income inequality. Uh, and third, for me personally, what matters to me most is maintaining my integrity and authenticity. Thank you very much. Thank you.